This is Just Asking Questions, a show for inquiring minds on reason. What's wrong with Tucker Carlson? Just Asking Questions. I'm Zach Weissmuller, Senior Producer for Reason. My co-host is Liz Wolf, Associate Editor at Reason. Hey, Liz. Hey, Zach. Earlier this month, Tucker Carlson took a trip to Moscow, and he really <laughs> seemed to like it. He released videos of himself gushing about a subway station, going grocery shopping, getting a piece of chocolate cake from a knockoff McDonald's, and even chatting with the president for a couple hours. That'd be Vladimir Putin, whom we should not assume just killed his political rival, Alexei Navalny, in prison. Tucker Carlson assured Glenn Beck on his show yesterday that you're an idiot if you think that. To help us analyze the Putin interview, understand what it is Tucker Carlson might be up to, and discuss the latest developments in Russian-U.S. relations, we're welcoming Michael Moynihan, journalist and co-host of the Fifth Column podcast and former senior editor here at Reason. Michael, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. First question I have for the room is, did Tucker Carlson do anything wrong simply by sitting down with Putin? Because that's been a little bit of the discussion. That That's what, you know, kind of Tucker Carlson has floated out there a little bit, The I, that he's he kind of uh, anticipated that people are going to attack him just for talking to Putin. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with just talking to Putin, but um, let's start there. Michael, what, what do you think about the idea of a journalist like Tucker Carlson going to Moscow, sitting down with Putin? Yeah, I don't know how much of a journalist he is, but I mean, I, the act of sitting down with Vladimir Putin is something that I envy Tucker for. I would love that opportunity. I mean, I've been into a few government offices um, in Moscow to interview people. And that process was amazingly difficult. So it's, you know, most people don't even try. I mean, Megyn Kelly uh, interviewed Vladimir Putin. And I think mm -hmm. great that she did. And Megyn Kelly, by the way, also interviewed Alex Jones, as did I. Nobody cares about me. They care about Megyn Kelly. And she got a lot of stick for that, for the um, idea that you platform somebody. We used to just call that interviewing them, um, but platforming somebody. We're two minutes into the interview and you've already brought up Megyn Kelly, though I do agree that she yes. is absolutely delightful. She's um, delightful. Yeah, no, the <laughs> platforming. Well, we'll also, you know, along those lines also, you know, we'll re there was a controversy around Errol Morris making a documentary yes. about Steve Bannon, which Correct. I thought was a great documentary. It was. Um, and, and, and you sat and down with trust... Steve Bannon too, right, Moynihan? I sat down with both Steve Bannon and Errol Morris. Um, okay. And Errol Morris told yeah. me that he couldn't find a distributor for his movie. I mean, Errol Morris, I mean, the most famous yeah. documentarian, probably short of Ken Burns in America, couldn't find a distributor for the Steve Bannon movie because it was Steve Bannon giving his ideas. Um, you know, when I sat with Bannon, it was the only time I've ever stopped an interview. And I didn't stop, I didn't stop it because there was, he said something, it was too long. It, we, we like ran out of cards, you know, you're filming these things on cards. And it was for an HBO documentary that I was doing, but he didn't stop talking. And he was endlessly fascinating. The guy is very, very bright. He's wrong about everything. And he identified me as a libertarian, unlike many libertarians don't identify me as a libertarian. And he sneered every time he said it, which, you know, in a way brings me back to Tucker Carlson, because I interviewed Tucker Carlson for a reason, a long time ago, in which uh, he professed his rock rib libertarianism. And at the time, he was a fellow at the Cato Institute. Um, and that's probably an organization he'd like to blow up at this point. But <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it's it is um, totally fine to sit down with him, and I'm happy that he did. But it, as expected, I mean, the interview was completely useless. Yeah. Yeah, do you think it was of much use? I mean, when we were prepping for this, uh, Zach wanted to give uh, Tucker credit where due for bringing up the Evan Gershkovich uh, question yeah. and pressing Putin on this. This is the Wall Street Journal reporter mm -hmm. who is uh, imprisoned in Russia right now. Um, and Zach was sort of like, well, credit where due, whereas I'm a little bit more in the camp of he didn't do, we didn't really find out anything new about Putin's headspace, in my view, based off of the Tucker Carlson interview. And yeah, the Gershkovich pressing was, I guess, semi ballsy, but it didn't really do much, I don't think. Well, let's, let's, play, the, let's play the Gershkovich clip yeah, sure. and then um, talk about it a little bit. Uh, Ian, could you roll that? Play. Evan Gershkovich, who's the Wall Street Journal reporter, he's 32, um, and he's been in prison for almost a year. Uh, this is a huge story in the United States. And I just want to ask you directly, 
without getting into the details of it or your version of what happened, if as a sign of your decency, you would be willing to release him to us and we'll bring him back to the United States. Мы столько сделали жестов доброй воли, что мне кажется, мы исчерпали все линии. We have done so many gestures of good will out of decency that I think we have run out of them. Ни разу не ответил. Но we have never seen anyone reciprocate to us in a similar manner. I think what makes this, and it's not my business, but what makes this difference is the guy's obviously not a spy. He's a kid. And maybe he was breaking your law in some way, but he's not a super spy and everybody knows that. And he's being held hostage in exchange, which is true with respect. It's true. And everyone knows it's true. So maybe he's in a different category. Maybe it's not fair to ask for, you know, somebody else in exchange for letting him out. Maybe it degrades Russia to do that. You know, you can give different interpretations to what constitutes a spy. But are you suggesting that he was working for the U.S. government or NATO, or he was just a reporter who was given material he wasn't supposed to have? Those seem like very different, very different things. I don't know who he was working for, but I would like to reiterate that getting classified information in secret is called espionage. So I, I don't know. I mean, it just it, it did strike me, you know, Tucker has taken a disturbing turn as of late in my mind. But that moment was it was almost like the old journalist Tucker, like coming through for a minute to me. And like, I, I don't know, I just think it's, it does take some balls to repeatedly press Putin on that question. But it was the I last question he asked. Credit? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think you are. I mean, it, 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 look, it was a, it was a good question. Uh, the follow-up question was even better than the initial question. Um, but it's the last question he asked. I mean, he's making sure that he secures his interview before he asks anything tough. And the whole point of an interview is to be tough from the beginning. And he didn't do that. And there's a million things about his own country that he could have asked about him. You're talking to the president of Russia, and I use that word in air quotes, he's not the president of Russia, he is the dictator, he's an actual dictator. People who soft pedal this are wrong, there's no independent judiciary, you cannot say what you want, the number of people, the number of artists who have spoken up against the uh, war in Ukraine, who have had to exile themselves, or have been exiled to the gulag, are too many to count. I mean, an American was arrested yesterday in Moscow, a ballerina, uh, who is of Russian background and is based in LA because she gave, and this is according to the Russians, this is not our interpretation of this, $51 to a charity in New York that supports Ukraine and Ukrainian refugees, I believe is actually their remit, but uh, $51 and she is facing life in prison in Moscow. This is not a country that is, you know, Viktor Orban's country, there's a, there's opposition. I mean, not a, not a government that I, I like, but there's a lot of people, and, and they've done a lot to, to squelch the free press, but you can still say Viktor Orban is an asshole and not go to prison in Hungary. That is not the case in Russia. So uh, Tucker Carlson has the opportunity that most of us don't have. And I don't, I think he squandered that op opportunity, but I, I will agree with you, Zach, that the question was good. If he started with that, I'd say, oh God, this is actually going to be a good interview. But he ended with that after allowing Putin to filibuster in a absurd version of Russian history for about 30 minutes. Yeah. Uh, you know, there, there was uh, another clip that I want to play that's of Tucker Carl. You know, he's he's pressed about these very questions that you raised, Michael, about why, why didn't you bring up any of the human rights mm -hmm. abuses, any of the repression? Um, it was at the World Government Summit where uh, Tucker was kind of reflecting on the Putin interview. Um, and he gives a defense of his interview style. And I'm curious what you think of this defense. So, uh, Ian, could you roll that clip? You should challenge some ideas. For instance, uh, you, you, you didn't talk about freedom of speech in, in Russia. You did not talk <laughs> about Navalny, about assassinations, about, about the restrictions on uh, opposition in the coming uh, elections. I didn't talk about the things that every other American media outlet talks about Why? exclusively. Yes, this because is my those question. are covered and because I have spent my life talking to people who run countries in various countries and have mm. concluded the following, that every leader kills people. 
including my leader. Every leader kills people. Some kill more than others. Leadership requires killing people, sorry. That's why I wouldn't want to be a leader. Um, that press restriction is universal in the United States. I know because I've lived it. I you know, asked my former, you know, I, I've had a lot of jobs. Um, and I've done this for 34 years and I know how it works. And um, there's more censorship in Russia than there is in the United States, but there's a great deal in the United States. And so, I, you know, at a certain point, it's like people can decide whether they think, you know, what, what countries they think are better, what systems they think Sir, are better. I, 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 I just I, want to know what he thinks. That was yes, the whole point. Yes. Uh, What's your reaction to that? I mean, where does one begin? I mean, a, a, every syllable there is stupid and offensive in almost every way. I mean, first of all, the false he, equivalency, the false equivalence is, is insane. But I mean, you start with this idea where where um, when he was, uh, you know, got this interview, he did a, a little piece to camera on the top of the uh, hotel in, in Moscow, a hotel I mm -hmm. actually stayed in. That was, the, I think that's the Trump hotel too, by the way, where the accusations in the Steele dossier <laughs> supposedly took place. But he's up there and he said, um, you know, no one is doing the job. No one is actually interviewing him. And of course, all the people who have wanted to interview him have said, you know, we put in requests and we're getting nowhere. So for him to say that everyone asked that question, but start the entire process of the interview, teasing the interview by saying nobody talks to him except for me. I mean, you can't you can't have both of those those thoughts in your head at the same time because you're the one who gets that opportunity. Nobody has, particularly since the invasion of Ukraine, and you don't ask anything. But the equivalency, I mean, all leaders kill people. Okay, well, we can say that that is broadly true, right? But that's that's saying that you know that there's no difference between you know, homicide and manslaughter. And if you're, you know, you could say Joe Biden kills people because America, you know, eliminated some Houthis uh, last week. But that's not the same thing as poisoning somebody who is a meek little journalist uh, or a rather strong and robust opposition leader. That's not the same thing. To say that all leaders kill people, the presumption is that all types of death that you could ultimately blame, be blamed for are the same. They are not. And the idea also that there is censorship in the United States is utter fucking bullshit. Excuse my language, but it's unbelievable that I did a thing when um, Navalny uh, was murdered. I went to every major Russian newspaper, major, you know, mainstream Russian newspaper, all of which are controlled by the Kremlin. There wasn't a mention in any of them for two days. Look at Steve Rosenberg, one of the bravest journalists out there, who's the BBC's correspondent in Moscow, speaks perfect Russian, has interviewed Putin, has inter I mean, you want to see a real interview? Go watch Steve Rosenberg interview Lukashenko in, in Minsk, in Belarus. And I, it's amazing that he was not assassinated right after the interview. But Steve Rosenberg is the, just doesn't care. He knows what his job is. And he's been allowed to stay as the kind of token opposition in Russia. But he actually went over the newspapers too and said, you know, there was maybe one or two paragraphs. But of course, people don't get their news um, from just state newspaper. Older people do, obviously, in Russia. But there was no mention anywhere, none. I mean, th that's forbidden by the government. Tell me an example of that in the United States, and I will tell you why you're wrong. The thing that has been um, really bothering me about this is there's an entire contingent of sort of anti-war libertarians who are taking this Tucker soundbite and really running with it. Um, and mm -hmm. to me, it strikes, it strikes me as so... Um, either stupid or dishonest, I'm frankly not sure which it is, because it's it's this complete erasure of degrees, right? Like the scale at which this is happening also matters a lot to me, right? Like, for example, a case that, uh, you know, tons of people have been in my mentions all day today, and then a whole bunch last week about how, oh, you know, Tucker's so wrong about uh, press freedom in, freedom in the US and all these things. Well, what about the Assange case? And it's like, first of all, Zach and I talked with Stella Assange, uh, you know, Julian's wife, um, you know, merely months ago on this podcast, right? So like, this is something that's like, we're reporting on, we're interviewing the mm -hmm. relevant people. We would love to secure an interview yeah. with Julian Assange himself. He's in prison in Belmarsh. And so currently and Stella is I'm who is available to us. sympathetic to his cause. I do not yeah. think he should yeah. be imprisoned yeah. for yeah. Yeah. publishing this material. A absolutely. But to some degree, like the, the thing that was bothering me so much about this, other than the fact that we literally have engaged with Julian's case and, you know, been reporting on it, is the fact that, the the scale at which this type of thing happens in you know each country when we're making comparisons also matters a ton right mm -hmm. the assange case is completely you know unacceptable that you know by the way the trump department of justice was the one that's trying to extradite him right um but you know it's completely unacceptable that that type of you know persecution and, and encroachment on press freedom is happening in the us 
Also, that case sticks out to some degree because it's a rarity compared to what happens under Putin's regime. And yeah. to me, these degrees matter, even if I oppose it always and everywhere. Yeah, I mean, I think it's worth looking at just the data on this, like to figure out how how bad is Russia? Is it just kind of, uh, you know, is is America like Russia light? Um, I, I don't think <laughs> yeah. so, because at, like every single pick your freedom index and it's going to rank Russia at the bottom. This is the 2023 index of economic freedom, which is done by the Wall Street Journal and Heritage Foundation, gives Russia an overall score of 53.8 uh, 53 and ranks it at uh, 125. Nigeria uh, is right above it. I love that. Nigeria is right below above it. Niger is right below it. Uh, you know, pr very low property rights, judicial effectiveness, business freedom. Um, the only thing that seems to be good at all is, um, well, it looks like trade freedom went up a little bit. I don't know if that's because <laughs> of, uh, you know, opening up uh, more trade with China or something like that. Labor freedom um, also went up because they're no longer yeah. like relying on Soviet slave labor. So props <laughs> to Russia. They're doing great these days. We're very proud. Here's Reporters Without Borders. Um, index, the 2023 index puts them at 164 out of 180. Um, uh, here's just a couple highlights. All privately owned independent TV channels are banned from broadcasting except for cable entertainment channels. That means no BBC, no Euro News, no France 24. Um, there's many laws relating to freedom of expression that have been adopted in recent years, including defamation and fake news laws mm -hmm. were amended to, in order to incorporate them into penal code, the penal code at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, distributing false information about the Russian armed forces or any other Russian state body is now punishable by up to 15 years in prison. Look, we've had some problems with, uh, you know, we, we've had our lodged our complaints with the way social media moderates speech and so forth. But we're not in a situation where you're getting 15 years for criticizing the federal government. Um, so it, it's, you know, it's worth just, uh, you know, dwelling on, on the data. Uh, th th and there's one more here. This is the Democracy Index, um, which is put together by the Economist Intelligence um, uh, Association or Institute. Unit, and, yeah. It, yeah. Unit, thank you. Yeah. Um, and this is just showing kind of the, the f all the following indices of democracy. We're, we, we link to all our sources. So if you want to dig into how they arrive at all these, um, you, you definitely should. But my point in that is like you, you can you, you don't have to cherry pick anything to, you know, find pretty broad consensus across the globe that in terms of freedom, R Russia is not, you know, R the U.S. is not biting at Russia's heels or anything. Yeah. Like I'm, I, the Soviet Union used to do something funny and occupied countries did the same. So, for instance, East Germany, they had a Christian Democratic Party. They had an SPD, the Social Democratic Party. I mean, they weren't real parties, but they had a fake opposition. So in the parliament, you'd give one seat in the Volkskammer to like the SPD or the CDU or something, and it was just a complete joke. Um, the same thing was true in Russia until recently with media. So you had three places. Rain TV, um, which is an interesting documentary, but it's not a great documentary, but it gives you a lot of background on how that came into being. Um, Echo Moscow. Uh, the radio station, um, which is off the air now too. And the guy who started and, and, and ran it is like controlled opposition at this point, a very old uh, white haired uh, journalist uh, who's just, you know, says what the Kremlin wants him to say at this point. Um, and Novaya Gazeta, the newspaper, which is where Anna Politskaya was a, a reporter and um, she was shot in the head for reporting on uh, war crimes in Chechnya and keeping in mind, I always find it in, in, incredible that the so-called anti-war people who don't appear to be opposed to war always, particularly when it comes to Ukraine and the invasion of Ukraine. Um, you know, the, Putin solidified his power in 2000 with the Second Chechen War. And what created the Second Chechen War was a series of apartment bombings in, in Moscow, on the outskirts of Moscow, killed 250 odd people. Uh, there was one that was, that was about to blow up um, and it didn't happen, but it was a it was a training exercise. That's what the people were seeing. If you go, if you look at that case, there's a number of people. The Economist has reported on this. It's a conspiracy theory that seems to be true, and a number of very very serious people um, have reported on this. Al Alexander Litvinenko reported on this that it was blown up. Those apartment buildings were blown up by the FSB with the purpose of of launching the Second Chechen War and then solidifying Putin's power. 
uh, Litvinenko reported that, and then he was poisoned in uh, England, in a foreign country, uh, by uh, members of the FSB who are now actually in the Duma. Uh, Alexander Lugovoy, who is the man who actually poisoned him, is in parliament, in Russian parliament, in the Duma, as a member of the United Russia Party, as a member of Putin's party. That was his reward for killing somebody on foreign soil who dared to write about the apartment bombings. I mean, there are a lot of people that love conspiracy theories. Tucker loves conspiracy theories. He's on, I mean, he's not even gone 9-11 now. JFK, RFK, aliens, vaccines, he's the guy full who in. Uh, allegedly uh, blew Obama back in yes. like, 2009 yeah, that was, or something. I mean, it was the only episode of his show that I watched and I was like, oh, this is pretty fun. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't believe it, but it was pretty fun. But he doesn't believe this. I mean, why not this conspiracy, which is one that is more consequential than any other that I can think of. I'm particularly, you know, for the peace in the Middle East and in, in, in the region of Russia, all of this that solidified Putin's power and allowed him to obtain more and more power. If you see in the early 2000s, there was a sense when, when George Bush said, I looked into his soul. And then of course, John McCain very famously said, I looked into his soul and I saw KGB, which is more accurate than what George W. Bush said. But there was a point at which, you know, okay, this is the way Russians rule. This is the way Russia always has been. It's never been a democratic country. It had a very, very brief experiment with democracy in the 90s, and it was sort of disastrous. And as it went through the 90s, Boris Yeltsin became more authoritarian and then handed the keys to Vladimir Putin, who, by the way, the interesting thing, gives him the keys to, the to and, and he's old and, and drunk and infirm at this point, and calls him on the night of his election victory. He's the self-appointed, you know, he's going to take over for Yeltsin. And um, he never called him back. This is an incredible thing, this video of this. They were filming a documentary and the rage that existed in Boris Yeltsin at the time is like, he didn't, he didn't call me back. I mean, are you kidding me? He's like, I'm waiting for his call. It's like, no, no, this was, once he took the reins of power, there was no uh, giving up on the reins of power. He was not loosening that grip at all. And in doing that, of course, you have to shut down all independent media. You have to arrest and kill everybody inside. I mean, the number of people that have been poisoned I mean, Navalny uh, was poisoned. Um, Viktor Yushchenko was poisoned because he was someone that was um, drifting towards the West in Ukraine. Vladimir uh, Karamurza, who I've actually spent some time with. Uh, Peter uh, Vereslav, who was the um, kind of manager of Pussy Riot, who I've also spent time with and is a very fun guy, uh, was also poisoned. The Skripals in London were, or in Salisbury were poisoned, um, defectors from the KGB. So it was funny when you saw people like who's this guy, David Sachs, I guess, online said, you know, why would he bother killing Navalny? He had him where he wanted. You ask Is any- David Sachs peddling this stuff too now? Of course, yeah. He's he's a, he's a big, cool. um, you know, Ukraine deserved it kind of guy. But cool. th- this this attitude is somebody who, or comes from people who have not read a thing or know nothing about modern Russia. And there are people that are close to Putin that are not his enemies who have confirmed this, that the thing is when you betray the motherland, they will go to no length to, to, to no end. Like they'll do everything they possibly can to punish you for it. And that happened two days ago in Spain. And I don't know if anyone noticed this, the man who um, was, he was a helicopter pilot in the Russian um, air force. And he flew his helicopter to Ukraine and gave it to them and said, I don't want to fight in this war. That's an anti-war person, by the way. I don't want to fight in this war. Um, and he was shot, I think 12 times in Spain assassinated. Uh, yes. I mean, this guy, I mean, it, he's gone. It's done. What, what's done is done. They found him and they killed him. The Skripals, I mean, the Skripal was, was convicted of giving uh, secrets to, to MI6. Uh, 10 years previous, they found him and they killed they how is kill it him. But so, but so how is it that Tucker and so much of the anti-war libertarian contingent and also, you know, big parts of the conservative movement, how is it that they're all so enamored with Putin and and like are they do you think they are unaware of this like why did they still fancy him after all of this is established I don't think they do I don't think okay. they really care it's a reflexive contrarianism of it's like, a contrarianism well, yeah I mean look I mean if Donald Trump was president when the Russians launched their invasion of Ukraine Donald Trump has said a number of times that what he would have done was that he would have gone harder he would have done you know he's he's claimed that he would bomb Moscow. Yeah. If Putin didn't uh, get in line, and he said the same thing about about Ukraine, like I would have, I would have. They never would have done it because I was the president. That's one of his lines. But if it had, I would have done something 
even more dramatic. So if that had happened, I think they'd all be on board. I don't think there's an ideological thing to this because very, very hard to divine the ideology of Putinism. I think there is that thing where, um, you know, they like the kind of conservatism. Pat Buchanan said this a long time ago, that, you know, their anti-gay stuff he loved. The fact yeah. that, you know, they were um, drifting towards, back towards the state church that he loved. So there Who's is that kind right? of social conservatism. But beyond that, I think it's just a reflexive kind of anti-American. It, it, it was funny in that interview. We, we don't have this clip, but there was a there was a point where Tucker Carlson was kind of trying to bait him into like declaring how like based in Christian yeah. Russia is. Yes. Um, yeah. and he's like, well, you know, we have a lot of different religions here and we try to yes. respect that. And then, <laughs> and then later Tucker's like, um, you know, is this like more of a spiritual war? This, this global war yeah. we're having. And he's like, no, not really. It's just, it's just politics. I mean, you see what but, he's doing in this though. I mean, he's absolutely playing with him and he enjoys that level of power. After the interview, he's asked by somebody on NTV or channel one or something in Moscow and says, you know, what did you think of the interview? And he says, I thought it was terrible. I got nothing from it. And I thought yeah. he, he asked me softball questions. He was humiliating the guy. He was also that talking is, about how he hopes like Biden wins, right? Like there's a certain of amount of people is like screwing with everybody, yes, right? Of course. And, 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 course. and men yes. sort of men casually mentioning how Tucker was uh, uh, rejected from the CIA. Yeah. Kind of planting yeah. Seeds during the interview. Like, oh, yes. he, yeah. Yeah. During the <laughs> interview. Um, it, it does make me wonder, you know, I guess to put on my conspiratorial hat, like, like, do you think that someone like Tucker Carlson had enough security around him? Like, could some just his behavior afterwards was so strange, which we're going to get into in just a minute. Mm -hmm. But like, what could, is it possible something like did happen to him there? Like, I don't think so. I mean, you're about compromat and all that. Yeah. Stuff, yeah. Like, yeah. About a possibility. Yeah. yeah. When I went to Russia in 2018, 19, something like that. And I was advised immediately to get a burner phone, to get a burner email account, never log into your email account in Russia. Everything is being listened to. Everything is being watched. They can hoover up absolutely everything. And I presume that he was smart enough to not, you know, bring his phone that they could actually duplicate it and, you know, have all of his messages and things like that. I mean, keep in mind that, you know, there's, there's people, there's spyware you can actually just send to somebody and they don't have to click on anything. And this is this kind of Israeli stuff that just embeds in your phone and starts sending information back to the host computer. But I don't think that he anything like that happened. There is something very strange about this, though. There is something very strange about wanting to impress the people who are who, who bring you there. There's nothing you can yeah. do about it. There's literally nothing you can do about it. You can say, I'm going to be tough. I'm going to be there. But, you know, Paul Hollander, who's a historian I mention all the time in the fifth column, um, has written multiple books about this. Um, his most famous one is called Political Pilgrims, about people in search for the better society. And usually it's Americans and, and, and Brits uh, going to Mao's China, going to the Soviet Union, going to Cuba, Nicaragua, et cetera. And he talks his whole chapter on the tour and what happens once you get there and how important the tour is, how they know exactly how to handle you and, and show you just enough opposition to show you just enough. Don't do it the North Korea way. because It's not believable. Mm. If you do the North Korea way, like, you know, this, we can't stop overfilling our grain quotas. I mean, isn't this insane? It's like, no, no, we have problems here, but look at how great everything is. I mean, I don't, uh, Tucker is not an independent actor in Moscow because when you see that, um, supermarket, for instance, and you say, oh, how amazing everyone lives. Look at these uh, subways. I did something that I mistakenly the other day when I was reading up again on the apartment bombings. I went back to this because I was just thinking about this with Tucker and conspiracy theories. And I think it's Raison was the name of the town that's just southeast of Moscow. So I looked at mm -hmm. the apartment buildings on Google Maps. And then I did Google Street View in this town. It, it literally looks like nothing has changed since the 1960s. It's a Soviet mm -hmm. dump. And I apologies to anyone who's listening who lives there, but I'll tell you what, it does not look modern. It does not look post-Soviet. It looks pre-Soviet in so many ways. And everyone looks grim and miserable. And this is the stuff that Tucker is not going to see because when you try to go and say, I'm going to go visit, um, you know, Memorial, the, the dissident group that's been shut down by Putin, by the way. And what did Memorial do? Incidentally, this is not about Putin. They um, were, uh, organization that did incredible archival work 
of people that were killed in the Gulag and killed by the Soviet Union, killed by Stalin. And it's an incredible organization. M Memorial was shut down because the past has to be controlled too, not just the present. And if you went to see somebody like that, if you were Tucker Carlson, you wouldn't last very long. They would make it very, very clear that that was not allowed or they would interfere with it in some way. So you're not, you know, on your own. I mean, when I was in Russia, I had to get a visa through the government and that required yeah. a lot of very specific stuff. The other thing, I mean, I, I've made this point in a few different places and for whatever reason, people continue to not really grok it. Um, but like, you know, I was recently in Bucharest, Romania and, you know, you get a car and you venture outside of sort of main city yes. corridor. Okay. Suddenly it feels like the shitty Romanian rust belt, right? It's like so boring, I'm literally, yeah. I was like breastfeeding my child on the side of the road in rural Romania. And there's just these like almost like zombie apocalypse looking people with like clearly haven't had dental care in the last two decades or whatever. Like mm -hmm. literally since Ceausescu was in power, like they haven't had, you know, brushed their teeth. And I'm just sort of looking and it's like, well, I've seen a lot of different forms of poverty around the world, but like if you just came to Bucharest and you just saw the, you know, film production crews uh, and went to some of the nice restaurants, then went to that like cool cocktail bar down there, you would have no clue that None. this type of Correct. thing is happening an hour away. And yeah. that's not just Romania, right? Like it's a gazillion, um, you know, shithole countries or formerly shithole, formerly communist countries that are like that. Uh, yeah. And that's just the side of it that I really wish people would pay some yeah, you know, amount I mean, of attention I, to. I spent like four days in St. Petersburg, Russia on vacation. Um, so, you know, probably not that much less time than Tucker spent in Moscow. And but just in that amount of period of time, and I, I was just there, you know, to, to see things, you notice right away that there's a lot of it's like there's these this really grand architecture, but like you get close to stuff and it looks kind of dingy. And then like, yes, driving back just to the airport, you just see like desolation. Um, so it just raises the question to me of, you know, it's almost cartoonish the way that he put together these shorts. Like it's over the like the style, the editing. Well, well, let's play the subway one because I just want to comment on like the way this is. The music, the score is, is incredible. Bizarre. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, Ian, roll the subway clip for us. <laughs> One of the ways you understand a society is through its infrastructure, the places where people gather, the places where they go to travel. If you've got a lot of people in one place, it tells you a lot about the people. So with that in mind, we're standing in front of the Kievskaya metro station and this train station next to it. Now, the metro station was built by Joseph Stalin 70 years ago. And the question is, how's it doing now? There's no graffiti, there's no filth, there are no foul smells. There are no bums or drug addicts or rapists or people waiting to push you onto the train tracks and kill you. No, it's perfectly clean and orderly. And how do you explain that? We're not even going to guess. That's not our job. We're only gonna ask the question. And if your response is to shout at us slogans dumber than the slogans we used to call Soviet and mock, that's not really an answer. <laughs> Like, what the hell is going on the here? The hills are alive with the sound <laughs> of communism. Um, I, you notice, by the way, uh, that he did Soviet in air quotes, which is pretty funny for somebody who is a... And, uh, a by the way, that montage ends on a shot of like a portrait of Lenin. So Yes, yeah, there's a, there's a, a relief of Lenin in there. But also, you might have noticed the name Kiev is in the, in the name of the station. And there is a, a plaque beneath Lenin, which is that final shot in that, which is about the eternal friendship between the Ukrainian and uh, Russian people. Um, and I imagine that that was on purpose. I'm not entirely sure if that was a little Easter egg, but you, you look at all these other images, which are classic constructivist Russian images of lantern jawed men with flags. And you know, that, that was a, the subway that was built with slave labor, people from the Gulag. I mean, yeah. that's not a, even d disputed. But I mean, like, can you break and this with... down for us, uh, Michael? Cause I mean, you, you know, you and Liz are, are in New York city, the subway mm -hmm. can be pretty shitty. So yeah, like, why sure. does Moscow have like this beautiful artwork and New York city doesn't? I mean, well, we didn't have Joseph Stalin, that's for sure. We did yeah. have the like WPA and these uh, public works projects, which actually tried to create, um, socialist art in New York City, and it became very, very controversial. You go back to the, the 1930s during the uh, New Deal that these, um, you know, Diego Rivera 
creating this big, uh, you know, communist memorial um, uh, in, in the middle of New York City and people objecting to it. But the reason this happens is dictatorships can create things like that. Yes. Yeah, sure. It's, I mean, let's be honest about it. North you Korea has less crime problem. than New York City. Do you want to live in yeah, North I Korea mean, or do you want to live in New York in, City? In these types of places, you can round up bums, right? Like you can just do all kinds of things to them far outside of the law, right? Like to yes. some degree, I want to, you know, I am frequently, you know, a critic of NYPD and I think, you know, most libertarians are. There's absolutely situations where they are use uh, excessive force on um, all kinds of people doing things uh, that, you know, we might dispute whether or not they should be considered crimes, right? Like mm. NYPD definitely errs in some ways, but by and large, they're not like rounding up bums and putting them in trucks and imprisoning them for a really long time or sending them to like forced no. labor camps or like, like that's not how bums and junkies are disposed of in New York. In fact, a, a big part of the criticism is that they're not really disposed of at all, right? Like we had this big push to do away with institutionalization. And to some degree, you know, we could kind of trace some of our current predicament to that, right? Like, and I, you know, maybe lots of New Yorkers are not comfortable with those trade-offs, but these are trade-offs either way you slice it, right? It's yeah, either the, yeah, public despair or private despair, but it's not like you're doing away with despair altogether, I don't think. Yeah, there's no Thomas Saz in in Russia, I don't think. <laughs> but the, the, the interesting thing about this is what he's essentially saying, I mean, but he's not saying in so many words because it's kind of, you know, camouflaged in so many ways. Is that this isn't a this isn't a policy thing, right? I mean, even if this were true, it is not true. There's an enormous amount of crime in Russia. There's an enormous amount of poverty in Russia. There's homelessness in Russia. There, you know, at the last phase of the Soviet Union, there's alcoholism in Russia, by the way. That, also, like, so, so that was the passed out in the middle. That was the big public works uh, thing in in 1985 and 86 when Gorbachev took over. It was like it was an anti-alcohol campaign because alcoholism was so bad and and alcohol was so cheap. It's the only thing you could get plentifully in the Soviet Union. So there's a lot of that, but why isn't it um, apparent right there? Well, I mean, you are you talking about the Putin regime? You're talking about the Russian character? I mean, why? Because it all exists. Why do you not see it in the subway? Well, it's a police state. Uh, number one. Number two, you know, imagine what would happen if this news story, which got a lot of press in New York City, of this um, these two NYPD cops that were set upon by a bunch of migrants, right? And they were arrested and no bail. They were released and then a bunch of them committed more crimes. Imagine something like that happening in Russia. Obviously, it wouldn't. And I can hear the Tuckers of the world saying, well, it shouldn't happen here. Yes, they shouldn't happen here. But the, the sort of tweaks around the edges of what could make city life better is not, the answer to that is not to have all power in the state. I don't understand yeah. people who are quote unquote conservatives or libertarians especially, believing that the way the state controls everything in Russia is something to be uh, applauded or ended. I'll give you one example of this. I, when I was in Russia, I was uh, with Vitalik Buterin, the guy who created Ethereum. <laughs> And he was, and he's a Russian, he speaks Russian perfectly, uh, met with Putin actually the day before I met him and was denouncing Putin yesterday. This is somebody who uh, uh, doesn't care. He has family there. His uh, parents moved after the fall of the Soviet Union to Canada. But when I was with him, we went to a, um, it was a technology park, I guess is what you call it, outside of Moscow. And I was talking to the guy who was like, you know, our handler. And he's like, this is our competition with Silicon Valley. And at one point I asked him, I was like, do you realize that you've done, the government has done this and you guys have a very poor record of the government creating big technology projects like we have in the United States. The Silicon Valley was created by some people like Sergey Brin, Russians <laughs> who were allowed through the magic of, of the free market to create it. And they were still doing this. They were still trying to create in a centrally planned way. It's not a communist country, but it's still that central planning instinct in like, is this the country that people like Tucker Carlson want to live in? Good God, I would, yeah, it's, I would escape yeah, immediately. It's 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 hard to believe that it that it is. Again, just from my very limited experience being there, it's like you walk around and sense right away that uh, I would think most Amer. If I would love to drop like uh, airdrop like all of Tucker Carlson's fans into Moscow or St. Petersburg for a day, just so that they can see the disconnect between what he's presenting and the reality of like day-to-day -day life that you can observe. I think there's probably other countries that maybe have good tr public transportation or something like that, that you could point to as better challenges. Sweden has <laughs> great public transportation. Sure, sure. Or, I mean, this is uh, part of why like the Lee Kuan Yew, like the Singapore argument drives libertarians so crazy because that, I think 
more reasonably grapples with the trade-offs of, okay, yeah, well, they have incredible yeah. results and yet they've cracked down on, you know, migration to such a significant degree. They cracked down on all manner of petty crimes and things that libertarians call victimless crimes. And yet they have pretty good results by a lot of economic freedom and like economic right. development metrics. And so that I think presents more of a thorny thing. Reason did a magazine piece by Mike Riggs, um, maybe three or four years ago that really broke down a lot of the state capacity libertarians sort of interest in Singapore and Lee Kuan Yew. So I, I recommend that mm -hmm. to anybody who's interested, but at least that is a better example of this. It's like Tucker Carlson picked one of the worst possible examples of yes, a place that's orderly, but a Potemkin village only on the surface, right? The thing that's so confusing to me is I'm not a New Yorker burying my head in the sand and saying, I love the current state of our subway system. Yeah, I love the MTA, horrible. right? Like I am simply saying, there are so many tweaks we could do, like actual enforcement of laws, right? Like mm -hmm. cracking down on fare evasion or, um, you know, cracking down on like public urination in the subway systems or public smoking inside the subway. Like there, we already have laws on the books that NYPD, by patrolling these stations, could choose to enforce. And that would probably get us half of the way there to what these people want. That doesn't require do having a complete police state, does it? Yeah. Yeah. How often do you see a rat that size uh, pulling a giant Cheeto or whatever it was in that video? Like, oh, that's like ever, honestly yeah. not infrequent. <laughs> Literally every yeah, day. No. Yeah, yeah, like right. people yeah. think the rat stuff is exaggerated, and it's like yeah. it, it's it really is absolutely not. It's but there, there is a weird thing here now, and I think it's kind of this inflection point with people who are, you know, we're in the libertarian orbit. Um, Tucker being one of them, and a number of these kind of nat cons were in the libertarian or orbit. And this inflection point is like, what kind of society do you want to live in? Because you still talk yeah. with that, the same cadence of a libertarian. But you talk about, when you talk about uh, Singapore, I mean, talk about El Salvador. I mean, Bukele is somebody who people, I mean, it's a Bitcoin country. We're gonna, we're gonna do Bitcoin yeah. and he speaks English and he's on Twitter and he's funny and he's a bit of a troll. And there are no civil liberties left in that country, but he's he gotten results. It. Yeah, I mean, he I, solved I, a lot of the cartel problem, but at what we, cost, right? And are we, we comfortable with that? We can't deny that that it has been successful. But yeah. yes, that's the thing, at what cost? And I think there's a lot of people who in the past really cared about liberty and now are very willing to mortgage that uh, for safety, for you know, nice subways, and you know, and also you know, shopping carts that don't move when they, they, go, which I think was probably invented in America because we've had it for years. But it shows you yeah. that a guy, it, it's that whole fucking video, by the way, was George Bush and the the scanner at the supermarket. Okay, in, hold on, let's, let's 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 play let's let's, it. let's play yeah. that video. Uh, Ian, could you roll the grocery clip? Uh, Tucker's cr uh, trip to the grocery store. <laughs> So a long-standing feature, maybe the longest-standing feature of Cold War propaganda in the West was the Soviet grocery store. No products, no choices, shoddily made things, and it wasn't actually propaganda, it was real. So we thought it would be interesting to take a look at a contemporary, modern-day, 2024 <laughs> Russian grocery store, two years into sanctions. All right, there we go. So I guess you put in 10 rubles here and you get it back when you I put guess. the cart back. <laughs> wow. So it's free, never, but there's an incentive that. to return it and not just bring it to your homeless encampment. I, hold on. I also, the thing I'll, <laughs> other, besides the, the George Bush thing that you're alluding to there, Michael, yeah. where it's like, wow, I've never seen such te technology. It's also like, are you're demonstrating that like there's low social trust. So you need this like coin to make people return the carts. I, I don't know exactly what the point is. Exactly so. right. I don't know why yeah. no one pointed this out. Zach, the first person <laughs> I've heard point this out. It's like that exists because people steal the carts. <laughs> they didn't steal the, that doesn't exist in like, you know, rural Norway. Uh, they expect people are going to leave the carts. I was literally just in rural Norway. And I must say this, the shopping experience at the grocery store was horrible. It's, uh, I mean, I lived in Sweden for high, many years. It's very high similar, social yeah. trust, but like disgusting people. I mean, that's the thing that's really confusing about all of this. You go to European grocery stores and then you come back to America and it's like, oh, thank God we're finally in the yes. land of abundance again. Uh, I yes, go to sure, any sure. European <laughs> country, not just the shitholes. And I'm like, yes. Well, it's, it's funny Russian because land of abundance. Yeah. He, he starts, <laughs> there's a very, very specific reason for this. You know, the reason for this video yeah. is going to the grocery store because as he makes very clear at the beginning, I mean, Tucker plays a dumb guy in a lot of this stuff, but he's obviously a very smart guy and he understands and remembers the grocery store stuff and, you know, yeah. the kitchen debate uh, be between Nixon and Khrushchev. But there's a story that very 
few people mention, and it's it's you know a few books will will uh, will mention it. But Yeltsin, Randall's, when, are you about he, to say Randall's? Uh, no, I'm talking about Yeltsin in in '89, and I think it was Clear Lake. Uh, Texas, I think it was clearly. Oh Texas. no, Houston! In the Randall's grocery store in Houston, where Yeltsin comes and he looks at yes, like, the popsicles, correct. and he's like, "Was oh, it was that Randall's?" Popsicles. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah not yeah. mentioned nearly enough is what's not mentioned nearly enough is that after he leaves this grocery store, he's on a flight, I believe, to Florida, and he says to some, I can't remember if it's his aide or something, and he's like, "We're doomed. It's over. Like we have lost." And this, in going to the Randall's in in Houston, and thank you, Liz, for correcting me on the name of the grocery store, that this was, you know, indication that there was there was nothing left for the for the Soviets at this point, and it was I, the wheels were coming off of it. But there's a reason. He's like, you know, they now they've won. They they have better grocery stores than we do, and you can get all this for a hundred dollars for your salary. That is. $100. Yeah, I want to keep. Let, let's keep. Let's keep here. rolling the clip for a second, because I, yeah. I there there is like to your point, Michael, that this there's you know, an intelligence to Tucker Carlson and maybe a playing dumb, like there's a level of economic illiteracy here that I find hard to swallow. Mm -hmm. um, so let's play the rest of the clip because that's- I went from playing. amused to legitimately angry. Um, so we were guessing what this would cost. Everybody hears from the United States by groceries and we didn't pay any attention to costs as we were just putting in the cart what we would actually eat over a week. And we all came in around 400 bucks, about 400 bucks. Um, it was $104 US here. And that's when you start to realize that ideology maybe doesn't matter as much as you thought, corruption. If you take people's <laughs> standard of living and you tank it through filth and crime and inflation, and they literally can't buy the groceries they want, at that point, maybe it matters less what you say or whether you're a good person or a bad person. You're wrecking people's lives in their country. And that's what our leaders have done to us. And coming to a Russian grocery store, the heart of evil, and seeing what things cost and how people live, it will radicalize you against our leaders. God. Yeah, not not really. Um, like when I look at so like just this is just the the numbers right here. Uh, you know when you look at per capita. Um, ah, hold on. Yeah, median income by country. I pulled this from World Population Review, which uh, compiles World Bank data. And on the left, you see medium income for the U.S. Uh, is about uh, this twenty four thousand three hundred twenty seven. For Russia, 9,563. And this is all in what's called international dollars. So it's like imagining an international currency that kind of adjusts for inflation rates that are differing across the globe. So just in like a sort of standardized like uh, currency there, you know, almost three times the median income in the US. And it's just like a, a very strange like misunderstanding of how, uh, I don't know, exchange rates But he doesn't misunderstand like that. it. That's the thing. I yeah. think he's expecting that his viewers will. And, you know, yeah. at the end of the day, I mean, what it is, is it's a great celebration of media freedom and capitalism in the sense that, you know, media freedom allows Tucker Carlson to have a show on cable and there's no fairness doctrine. You can have Fox News. And then when you leave that, you can be free on the internet to have your own subscribers and make money from Elon Musk or wherever he's making it. Um, you know, and also the amount of money that he's made allows him to have no clue about basic things like how a shopping cart works, that there are these very basic technologies that he's marveling at, which is, again, a very, very weird backward celebration of what is great about America, is that he became a very wealthy man because we have a free press. He, be he became a wealthy man off of the free press. And you, you cannot do that in, in Russia. To have any level of wealth in Russia, you have to express extreme fealty to Vladimir Putin. And then, as a matter of fact, they did this very publicly. Um, including people like Mikhail Kordakovsky and Boris Berezovsky. They had a television program in which Putin, and early in his, his tenure, um, had all of the members of the oligarchy surrounding him on television and warning them, you do things for us now. You don't do things on your own. And Kordakovsky went to jail. Um, um, you know, Berezovsky went to London and hanged himself, ultimately. Some people say it was the FSB. I think he probably did hang himself. But that the people that didn't play ball were killed, I mean, or, or exiled. I mean, that is, it, it, that's the difference, Tucker, between how you became rich and how you become rich in, in, it, in Russia. 
is Tucker like I, I'm interested, obviously we can't divine Tucker's uh motivations here. Uh, but I keep coming back to this question of is he lying? Is he misleading people? Like why would he be doing this? How how much of a how deliberate is this all really? And the thing that I keep coming back to is the fact that the grocery store thing, first of all, strikes me as really funny because I would imagine Tucker being as rich as he is and having seemingly the infrastructure that he has in his life, whether uh, spousally provided or servant uh, provided, right? Like, you know, hiring mm -hmm. a, a personal assistant. I, I would imagine that he's not out there doing the family grocery shopping, no. right? I would imagine <laughs> that part of the reason why he seems, uh, why his naivete is showing when he's in this grocery store is because like, either he has a bunch of people who does this, do this for him, or he hires, you know, gets his groceries entirely delivered. But I would imagine he's like, pretty out of touch with what the actual standard American shopping experience is. He's just trying to curry favor with his middle American conservative viewers uh, for whom this is much more of a reality, right? But the thing that I keep coming back to is that's my theory. And then also he made some weird comments recently about, well, really the reason why he's so interested in, um, you know, really listening to Putin is in part because with all of the ex escalations between, um, you know, the U S and Ukraine and Russia, he's really worried about the possibility of entering another war. And since he has so many children, he has four children who are draft age right now. Uh, he's, such a, an ardent uh, war opponent and U.S. entanglement opponent because he really has personal stake in the matter. Okay, you actually do any digging, and that's not true. Tucker yeah. does not have four children who can be drafted. And does he even have four children? Like, they're, they're you know, you have to be because a, he, have, a he has man. two that are of the age, and they're both women. They're women, right? Yeah. They're girls. Yeah. Okay, so, like, boom, right there, unless the, the lead cards get their way. <laughs> yeah, right? But, like, you Something know. Something you can thank libertarians party, for, by the way. <laughs> right. But regardless, like he's just lying. He's saying, you know, the reason why I'm so interested in this is because I'm, you know, quaking with fear that my children could possibly be drafted. And like, that's just not true. Not true. His kids are safe. And no. so like how much of this is deliberate obfuscation and attempting to basically say the things that he thinks his, you know, 55 or 60 year old uh, average viewer in, um, you know, rural Indiana want to hear. There's a thing that people, you know, on MSNBC when they're talking about the MAGA types and, you know, audience capture and how Fox News are just, they're smarter than this and they're giving these people red meat and they're too dumb to understand they're being lied to. And the people who are doing this are lying to them. The, you know, the broadcasters mm -hmm. themselves are lying to them, Dinesh D'Souza or Tucker Carlson. They're missing something very big. And if you go back to the fellow traveler movement, you know, in the US from kind of 19 basically 1917 to 1991, I mean, it was especially bad in the 1930s, there's something that you notice. And what you notice is that they absolutely believe it and they're absolutely lying. So they're, they, they're lying and telling the truth about their own belief. Tucker believes this stuff, but he knows that he's giving a picture that is, shall we say, incomplete. Um, but does he believe the kind of politics that he's spouting now? I have from v v multiple very good sources that he absolutely does believe it and that this is not a money grab. I mean, Tucker Carlson comes from the, you know, Swanson frozen dinner fortune. I mean, his name is Tucker really? Carlson. His, his brother's name is Buckley. I mean, these are people that are, are as bad as waspy and, um, or Swedish, I guess. Uh, I as, like as that he be, didn't you know? break his uniform even while traveling, right? He still looks like he's like wearing Sperry's, right? Like yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Weekend in the Hamptons. That was the most put on thing yeah. in the past was when he was wearing a <laughs> little bow tie. But no, I think he believes the general idea of it. And I think it's, I think that there's a point at which you become somebody from the other side. And this is what I'm waiting for. Um, this is where I think that maybe audience capture will come in and not actually publicly uh, saying something like this, but n you can think of a, a number of people. One, in, I'll, I'll give you one in particular, Tulsi Gabbard. She was a Democrat. She was uh, ran as a Democrat and, you know, is essentially not a Democrat anymore. And there was a story today that Donald Trump is even considering her as his VP candidate. Now, I saw that this morning. I mean, I don't know how true that is, but it doesn't strike me as odd. But getting to that point, I wonder if the same thing will have with Tucker. I mean, he has, you know, Max Blumenthal on his show on Fox. He has all of these people that are on the kind of Chomskyite left when it comes to foreign policy. He really doesn't like capitalism. He really doesn't like uh, free markets. He has a very, very obvious authoritarian streak um, that I always associate in the 20th century with people on the left, actually. I mean, there's examples of it on the right, but mostly on the left. 
So I wonder if, if this ideological journey takes him to the other side and that this might be a very honest, natural journey. I don't know how it happens because one of the things about being a conservative in the 1980s and 1990s where Tucker kind of came up was understanding what the kind of sycophantic pro-Soviet left was engaged in. I mean, he knew that. I mean, he wrote about it. I mean, he worked at the Weekly Standard in the mid nineties. He, you know, go back to everything that he wrote. He was a very talented journalist. He's not anymore, but he was a very, very talented writer. Um, and, you know, I always point out that one of the most impactful stories in 2000 and the George W. Bush's campaign was the Carla Faye Tucker story, which was the, the woman on death row that George Bush mocked. He mocked Carla Faye Tucker to Tucker Carlson, who wrote about it for George Magazine. I mean, he was breaking news stories and having impact. And I don't know if that got boring or something, but I think that he is has an early onset version of something I call ideological dementia. I mean, I see it with so many people as they get older, um, they become, you know, January 6 types, they become super ultra MAGA types, or they become, you know, lunatics on the other side. I mean, there's a certain point where you just start not caring anymore. Your kids have grown up, you've made your money, you don't have to kowtow to anyone, and you just become a little more susceptible to extremism. And I think that's where he is. Yeah, he. I mean, yeah, he's he is the living embodiment of the horseshoe theory, and yeah. it's like the where the horseshoe Absolutely. ends is uh, just authoritarianism. It doesn't matter if it's <laughs> yes. right or left, <laughs> exactly. Um, and that that's where indistinguishable it sometimes. Yeah. yeah, and um, the you know apologies for the Soviet system, like you, this could have been like Bernie Sanders twenty years ago. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, he went on its honeymoon, famously yeah. to the Soviet Union. Um, and, you know, in contrast to uh, the, the, you know, the, the weird thing that happened and tragic thing that happened this uh, last weekend was the passing of Alexei Navalny, who, in mm -hmm. contrast to Tucker Carlson, actually was exposing uncomfortable realities about yes. Russia, which is why yeah. he was so hated. Um, I mean, I don't know how much people know about Navalny, but part of his rise to fame was as someone who would post these exposés on digital media, yeah. YouTube. Uh, and um, part of his strategy was to build a profile for himself because he thought if he got famous enough, then he wouldn't they wouldn't be so likely to knock him off. Um, Obviously, he he uh, died this weekend, um, but I think he he's uh, he's become uh, a potent symbol. We'll see how long you know he lasts as that that kind of symbol. Um, and I, I've got a clip that I have to kind of ex exemplify some of the American reaction to that, especially on the political right. But before I get into that, I'd let, I'd love to hear your reflections on Navalny, um, uh, Michael. I'm just a man of uncommon bravery. I mean, the, the word bravery is something that we throw around um, pretty loosely these days. But, you know, when we look back at things like the Holocaust, um, like the hideous Soviet experiment, why did more people not stand up? Well, because bravery is a very rare commodity. It's a very, it's not a very common thing. People think that they would be that person. They almost never would, myself included. And, you know, I don't, I don't exempt myself in any way. I mean, this is a man who went back to Russia after being poisoned by so, the Kremlin. I'm sorry to say that, you know, the, the lunatic Putin lovers can pretend that that's not what happened. It's obviously what happened. And he went back and he knew what was going to happen to him. And not long ago, um, recorded a video about, you know, what to do in the event of his death. Normal people don't do that. Um, you know, if there's there's a couple of these examples in Russia. Most of them have very uh, cleverly f fled the country, and I don't blame them. I mean, the people, the, the girls, uh, women in Pussy Riot, um, who I've known a bit over the years, um, you know, they have their media zona, which where they do incredible reporting, like I just saw something the other day, where they're um, confirming the number of people died who have died in the Ukraine war, uh, part of the Russian forces. It, only with stuff that they can verify. And they're up to almost 50,000. Only with things they can verify. There's no publicly available data. There's no stuff in newspapers. They're counting graves. They're finding things on Instagram and Facebook of, of uh, funerals and things. Um, so that's the country that uh, these people are praising where I think probably the more accurate number would be about 200,000 people have died in that idiotic war. And keeping in mind that about 15,000 
people died between 1979 and 89 in the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, which basically crippled the Soviet Union. Um, Putin's a man who has control. I mean, why does Navalny go back and know? I, look, his idea was that, yeah, maybe if I'm this famous, they can't do much to me. I mean, there's an, uh, it, was an, it won an Oscar, didn't it, that Navalny documentary? Yeah. I mean, yes, that, I it, this shows you exactly the position that Putin finds himself in. The number of people who have been poisoned, the number of people who have been shot, the number of people who have been imprisoned. I mean, you, you know, it's, it's incredible that one of um, his most sort of well-known opponents, and I think probably most effective, was shot in front of the Kremlin. Like, you know, sort of 50 yards from the walls of, of, of the Kremlin. I mean, what is the response? You know, what is the world to do? I mean, nothing. He knows that. So why not stop? I mean, it, it's like, why would you stop doing this? If you, if you can steal and everyone sees you stealing, but they don't ever arrest you or prosecute you, you keep stealing. I mean, that's essentially what he's doing. And, you know, killing somebody who's his opponent is sending a message to everybody who would dare oppose him. Because I mean, look, th one of his own creations, one of his former chefs, uh, Prigozhin, who who was you know running the Wagner group, um, yeah. tried to have a little uh, revolt. And guess what happened to him? Oh, come back! We'll we'll make we'll make peace. We'll talk it out. And then get up in a helicopter and it blows up, you know, two oh, weeks later. Mechanical engine problems. Yeah, who knows you know? like, what they're stuff, stuff they're happens. It's yeah. not about yeah. getting rid. You can silence them by putting them in Siberia. It's about scaring yeah. the ever loving hell out of your citizens and anybody who would oppose you. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, Navalny's uh, widow and, and family, of course, says that yeah. this demonstrates the fear that the Putin regime has, that they felt like they had to act at this moment, um, that he's vulnerable going into the election, which will not be a real election, a obviously. Real election, right? Like, no. that would yeah. be a time for Tucker to actually use scare quotes to great effect. Um, yeah, yeah. He only so, chose to do scare quotes. Soviet. Scare quotes. <laughs> Soviet and corruption also. Did you catch yes, that corruption. one? Yeah, yeah, corruption. Yeah, not I mean, we should have, we should have watched one of Navalny's videos of, of yeah. both uh, Medvedev and, and Putin's palaces that they live in. And uh, they're incredible videos. And I mean, there was, I think it was that David Sachs um, joker who has remade himself as a, you know, Russia simp Ukraine expert um, saying that, you know, he wasn't popular anyway. Now, th there's a, there's a, in Russia, there's a reason that people say this. I mean, you talk about, Gary Kasparov, who I've interacted with a lot over the years, who, you know, ran and was going to, he actually wasn't popular at home, um, you know, much like Gorbachev running in the first election after, after the fall of the Soviet Union. He wasn't popular at the time either. But Navalny actually was popular. The closest you got to any pressure on Putin, which made him freak out with those marches in Moscow, which were very, very big by almost all standards, and you look at the number of views that those uh, videos that Zach was just mentioning had, I mean, tens, if not hundreds of millions, both in Russian and in English. And, you know, to say that somebody yeah. is not popular shows that somebody who says that believes everybody lives in a society like they live. It's very hard to be popular um, when the any levers of the state are not, not available to you. The yeah. media is not available to yeah, you. The, the idea of public uh, opinion is not really even just, it's not a, a coherent concept in yes. a culture like, uh, or in a, in a political system like In a Russia. dictatorship. I mean, you can't go on yeah. TV and debate things. There are debate programs yeah. in Russia in which everybody agrees on everything and they're insane to watch. Navalny's not on those shows. Would he have been popular if he yeah. was on those? Very, he's a very charming guy, very witty guy, and a very smart guy. If he was on there challenging the regime who is killing their sons and uh, not sons and daughters, their sons, um, very traditionalist in a Buchananite way, only the sons are dying in Ukraine. But th th if someone is challenging that on television, you bet your ass he'd be a lot more popular than, than, than he was when he was murdered. Yeah, I, I recommend the documentary because you also get a sense of his um, charisma and um, the sort of his political acumen, his ability to, you know, perfectly tap into the issues that are pissing off people in the streets. Yeah. Um, and you see some of that play out. And so if you're going to, you know, speculate as to whether this guy had some viable movement or not uh, in the absence of you know, it being crushed by the state, at least watch the documentary and, and try to evaluate yeah. that yourself. Uh, Moynihan, and, and so you've like, been breathing yeah. some fire, um, you know, in David Sachs's direction, but what about Glenn Greenwald? 
Uh, I mean, I'm being totally serious here. I haven't really followed what he's okay. been writing about this stuff, but I will. I mean, I, I know what he said in the past. Um, yeah, there's just I, a little bit of Tucker Carlson fondness and sort of like there's yeah, an entire friends. contingent. Yeah. There's an entire contingent of people, and I think David Sex is definitely one of them. And I also see this among like the Dave Smith's whole crew of little followers, um, where there's this, you know a lot of cheerleading of Tucker's comment, uh, you know, about how all, all leaders kill people. That's why I wouldn't want to be a leader. Um, and I've definitely said some more than others. Greenwald <laughs> jumping aboard this a little bit. Uh, and you know, I mean, Mao and Biden also been, same, right? everybody, there, you know, uh, there, so like we, we just talked about Alexei Navalny and what he's been up against. Um, there's also been Donald Trump mm -hmm. saying that he's just like Navalny. Uh, let's mm -hmm. that Navalny. Clip to get, yeah. yes, he's a, he's a form of Navalny. Um, let's, let's look at that for a second. During this campaign, a huge amount of your time has been spent in court, in the courtroom in New York and, and so forth. Now, in this New York civil fraud case, this judge Arthur Engeron ruled against you for actually almost a half a billion dollars. Uh, it's a lot it of, a lot of dough. It is a form of Navalny. It is a form of uh, communism or fascism. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, is, yeah. This, is Trump in the same situation as Navalny? No, I, I think that you have to do the throat clearing and say that the kind of lawfare being used against Donald Trump, I oppose in almost every Wait, I think this will be thrown out an appeal. I mean, I, I mean, how could it not? If you if you actually look at the case, that's not that's not something that Navalny had access to, by the way. An appeal they don't <laughs> that didn't happen in Russia. You, he couldn't appeal his poisoning or his prison sentence or his being murdered in prison. Um, it, his Arctic Circle penal penal colony, right? Like yeah, I mean, this is the. It, by the way, you notice something that I noticed. When I saw Trump uh, in uh, Detroit um, about four months ago at a union thing but there was actually no union people there it was really funny um i did a, i did a piece on this and at I, I was surprised when i was sitting there in the kind of pen of journalists when he said fascism because it's very classically trump thing he has no idea what that means doesn't care much like the people in msnbc who say i don't know what it means either but it's it's a bad thing and so he picks it up much like fake news was a hillary clinton thing that became a trump thing so i think it's hilarious at the end he's like this is fascism but the navalny stuff is like you know because two things happen do you just flatten degrees? There's no degrees of anything. You know, he's being screwed and I'm being screwed. There are people who are opposed to him. There are people who are opposed to me. If that's the way you think, I mean, I expect Donald Trump to think like that. He's running for president. I mean, does he believe that? And who knows what the guy believes? But if you are actually convinced by that, and I have talked to people who I respect, who are convinced by it and say, well, he's not entirely wrong. He's not entirely wrong that in every society throughout, you know, history, Political, you know, th there's been politics involved in legal cases and trying to destroy people, et cetera. I mean, this is common in the UK. I mean, you could say the same thing's happening to Boris Johnson, you know, with, with the COVID inquiry, inquiry there, is to destroy the, the, you know, the Conservative Party. I'm sure that there are a lot of people who want to destroy the Conservative Party. I'm sure that a lot of people think that that's a great thing to do. It'd be a great byproduct of this inquiry into the COVID stuff, this would be a great byproduct into in inquiries into Donald Trump. It's kind of never ending. And I think a lot of these trials um, that Trump is going through are complete horseshit. And I think that there's a lot of sensible people on both sides who believe that. To believe that, you know, um, killing somebody in prison, poisoning them, running their family out of their, uh, their native country, that there's something that's even equivalent in the US is ridiculous. I don't think any serious person would actually think that. Yeah, the the worry. So the some of the people that you've brought up, Liz, that um, draw these equivalencies, I, I think what they're attempting to do, and I, I've got some sympathy for some of their positions that like, yeah, we should be people should be paying attention to what's happening to Julian Assange. You know, maybe there have been mistakes in the past in terms of moves that were made with NATO over the preceding decades that led up to that moment that could be analyzed to adjust U.S. foreign policy. Like all, all this stuff to me is a totally legitimate debate. The way that speech is being, um, let's say, nudged by tech companies, like that's all concerning stuff, especially as we're heading into an election here. here. But 
the conflation of these things, the danger that I that I see with it is that then you are you become unable to recognize when it really is happening if you see the if you're if you're equating the worst case scenario in another part of the world to a situation that's not here, you're just losing people who can see that reality. So you, you need to stay hewed to what is actually going on and keep a sense of proportion in mind. Well it's it's also just fucking untrue, right? Like that's the main problem yeah. here, right? Like you look at the actual details of the civil fraud judgment against Trump. And yes, it's, you know, mostly horseshit that he will, you know, be possibly be forced to pay that obscene amount of money, you know, more than $300 million. And then there's interest tacked onto that. And yeah, that will probably be appealed. However, there is the basic thing, which is like, A, you know, lenders, it's, it's a little bit tough to prove that the lenders were harmed to the degree that I guess, one would need to be in order for this to really stand and to hold. And I could understand making the case that banks needed to do their due diligence and really this type of inflation of asset value happens all the time. But also Trump did stuff wrong, right? Like he lies in every area of his business dealings. And the only thing that this case did was just confirm that uh, and bolster that, right? He lied about the, the square footage, which sometimes square footage is more an art than a science, but like he lied about the square footage to a pretty significant degree of his Trump Tower apartment. He's lied about uh, whether or not Mar-a-Lago could be converted into a uh, residential use upon selling, which is something where there's a deed restriction in place, right? Like all of this just establishes, and you actually go through the details, a pattern of just like not being totally honest toward the lenders who he was working with. However, like that is not the most heinous of all crimes in my book. And I think it's perfectly reasonable for people to not be Trump sycophants uh, or, you know, addled with Trump. Uh-oh. We lost your audio there for yes. a few Yes, I have yeah. crazy dogs in the background. But like, you don't uh, have to be a total Trump sycophant or somebody who has Trump derangement syndrome in order to say, hey, Trump does some things wrong. But there's definitely this pattern of political persecution playing out with some of these cases against him. And we're not really keen on that happening either. The much more prudent way of handling this would be to run a good election against him and handle things that way. And instead, for whatever reason, that like middle ground level yeah. has just been lost. I mean, it's been stunning to me watching people on both sides, sorry to both sides it, but just kind of losing this sense that Trump does things wrong sometimes, but also perhaps we don't need to be throwing the book at him to such an obscene degree. It's, I agree with almost all of that. And, you know, people tend to lose focus on the fact that Donald Trump has done a lot wrong. <laughs> this is not as if Alexei Navalny didn't do anything that would be considered illegal or wrong in the United States. Yeah. But yeah, no, it's the the it's not both sides. The, the sort of relativism allows people yeah. to not have a conversation. It's so when you say Navalny was killed and you've been sycophantic to uh, Vladimir Putin and his regime, the response is, well, what about this? I mean, the, you know, it's a the what aboutism is a stupid thing, but the the perniciousness of it is that it changes the debate. You don't have to have a conversation about Vladimir Putin and what Vladimir Putin's doing. You can say, well, you know, I mean, we do the same. I mean, Trump, remember Trump said the same thing to um, Bill O'Reilly. When Bill O'Reilly was uh, talking about Putin, he said, you know, we've done bad stuff too. Well, that's not what we're talking about. We can have a separate conversation about that. Let's first talk about what Putin has done that's bad, what Russia's done that's bad, et cetera. That kind of, you know, it's all the same. Look. We see an analog on the left, and I've been bitching about this since 2016 you know, or 15, with Trump the fascist. Um, and you look at the search terms and you know those Google charts and it just goes, goes pops right up at around 2016, 2017. Trump is a fascist. And you have a guy like Tim Snyder, um, a historian of fascism, a guy who knows quite a bit about this, and a guy who I've lost almost all respect for because what he's saying is like, there's things that are alike, right? You know, we, it's the, the cult of personality. That's what fascism does, right? Um, calling the media the enemy of the people. That's what fascism does. It's just enough alike, but by degrees, it's not even close, right? I mean, pr prior to the Nazis taking power, there was bloodletting on the streets between the communists and the Nazis, people dying by the dozens. I mean, this does not happen in America. I mean, we had January 6th, and we thought somebody was killed by a protester, and it was a you know, a heart attack or something it turned out to be. But that's not what's happening in America. But, you know, there's enough stuff that looks when you lay it next to each other kind of similar. Yeah, but you have to leave out all the details. 
for it to be like, well, this is the feel of it too, right? Like it comes back to the, what we were talking about earlier, right? Like this is, we're talking one January 6th situation, not this type of thing happening on mass and becoming normal, Every day. right? Like, yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's completely different. Yeah. And having a political process that deals with it. And I think that, you know, the, the judicial process has been overdone, uh, to be honest, but I can say that. And that's a perfectly legitimate thing to talk about. And I don't worry about um, my family being run out of New York City or run out of America. Yeah. Do you- At least for now. Moynihan, At least for now. <laughs> do you have, Moynihan, I just want to, before we wrap, I want to ask, do you have any sort of like grand uh, animating theory about why Tucker Carlson is doing this and what the value, what the purpose of his little Moscow tour really was. Um, I mean, it's hard to say, but one of the things I think that is pretty common to Tucker Carlson and to, you know, Beatrice Webb in the 1920s or, you know, any people who went and saw the show trials and uh, which is the most unbelievable, like obvious perversion of justice that was, they made a Hollywood movie about it, showing that it was a great thing called Mission to Moscow. I mean, people are willfully blind. They, they really don't want to believe these things, um, but they know they're true, right? And they, everyone who saw what was going on in the Soviet Union knew what was happening and they came back and they lied about it. They lied about it when they were there too. But there's something about a kind of adversarial culture. It's be, like, you know, being Tucker Carlson here is like you leave Fox and he becomes even more adversarial to the to the mainstream culture. And one of the ultimate things to do there is to be pals with or make videos about Vladimir Putin. And everything that you know is wrong. There's a certain satisfaction that people get in that and they get followers that way too, whether you're doing it on purpose or not, saying, oh, you think you know what happened on 9-11? You think you know what happened at Pearl Harbor? You think you know that there was a man on the moon? Whatever it might be. You think you know what's going on in Russia. I went to Russia. It's not what they're telling you. People love telling an audience that it's not what they're telling you. That's, I mean, whether it's pandemic or any of this nonsense that you see on, on uh, YouTube. And I, I mean, I can't stand the fact that YouTube and people like that try to take this stuff down because it's not only just playing whack-a-mole, but it encourages people like that. I'm happy that Tucker Carlton, Carlson is out there saying things that ultimately make him look foolish. But I think that kind of adversarial position in the culture of being the adversary is something that really appeals to him because he's too smart to think that this kind of nonsense that he's spouting about Russia is even close to being true. Well, with that, Michael Moynihan, thank you so much for talking to Reason. Thank you both. Thanks for listening to Just Asking Questions. These conversations appear on Reason's YouTube channel and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed every Thursday. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and please rate and review the show.